Uh, I'm Herb Fockler from Wilson Sonsini, uh, uh, your host here today. Uh, we are jointly sponsoring uh, this program with Wharton. We're delighted to be uh, a part of it and have the opportunity to, uh, uh, to speak with all of you. But I'm not speaking today. Um, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Mark Greenow. He's president of the Greenow Consulting Group. I think we worked together 20 years ago or something like that. Um, when both of us were probably in high school, I think. Yeah. So, so um, at least my hair was dark. And I had hair, so you know that's the way it goes. Um, Mark has over 30 years of consulting experience in advising entrepreneurs and investors uh, on strategy and execution of uh, financial and administrative functions. Uh, he's worked with Palm, Jimbery, Kana Software, Scale Ventures, Silicon Valley Bank, Capital Group, 500 startups. Um, and uh, he's also held senior executive positions at USVP, Ernst & Young, and Levi Strauss. Uh, we're delighted to have Mark here today. Uh, uh, the topic um, is, uh, you know, pragmatic considerations in setting up your business, keeping the front office open by getting the back office right. I've got to say, yesterday I was talking to a, uh, an entrepreneur, and all these questions came up, and I, you know, I said, you know, I wish you were an alum of Wharton because we'll be talking all about this today. Um, so, Mark, I'll turn it over to you. Let me say one more thing. Our next presentation um, is February 2nd, um, and uh, it'll be up in San Francisco, um, and uh, it's, the topic will be valuation of, uh, of companies, uh, the number one question that we all get. And it's, it's Ashmeet Sardani of uh, uh, Foundation Capital will be, uh, be uh, joining us then. So um, welcome. I hope you find this useful. Mark, let me turn this over to you. Good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Wilson Sassini and uh, Warden, for allowing me to speak to you this morning. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to just a show of hands, I guess, to find out what kind of audience I have uh, in front of me. I've talked to a couple of you while you're uh, munching on some bagels. You know, how many people here in the room are, are entrepreneurs or would-be entrepreneurs? All right, great. And uh, uh, how many are uh, currently Warden students? Okay, great. All right, and uh, lastly, uh, how many of you are like me or you know, kind of blood-sucking uh, service providers that are always looking for clients? Uh, okay, great, now we got you identified. Good, <clears throat> anyway, uh, this is meant to be an interactive uh, session this morning. Uh, it's bright and early, I see you all have coffee, I'm just nervous, so I don't need any caffeine this morning. Um, by all means, stop me, interrupt me, ask questions at any time. Uh, the session will go much better, um, I'm certain. Uh, first, um, I'd like to define what we're going to do, the agenda. First, I'll uh, define what a back office means. Um, secondly, I'll spend some time telling you some war stories about common errors that I see entrepreneurs make. Uh, then I'll talk about what's a kind of a classical evolution of the organization. Um, talk about what it costs to run a back office, and more importantly, what costs of errors are. And then uh, trigger points for transition uh, as a company evolves and as uh, natural uh, development. There are points in which, uh, on the back office, the general administrative side, that you want to, um, you know, be aware of and be uh, concerned about. And then uh, I'll wrap up the session uh, this morning by giving you some insights to some of the, the commonly used resources that are available here in the Silicon Valley. And I'll have probably some pithy opinions about some of the, my comp competition, some of the other service providers. I certainly uh, uh, recommend. You know, Wilson Sassini is the best uh, law firm in the Valley. Did I get that plug right? Yeah, okay, yeah. I got that done. Uh, yeah, the honorarium is in the mail, I can tell already. Um, so, anyhow, what do we mean by back office? Um, first off, it's the areas that usually fall under the chief financial officer's uh, responsibility or the COO. It's uh, under the finance uh, area, it's accounting, tax, audit, treasury, planning, Risk management. Risk management usually means uh, the insurances, and legal. Usually, the CFO is responsible for the relationship with uh, your outside legal counsel or in-house legal counsel. <clears throat> it also includes human resources. Typically, this is the management of payroll, which is something we all love to have. Benefits administration, uh, compliance, and employee development. It's often an overlooked area in uh, startup companies. And lastly, uh, an area information technology, the IT side of the business. 
typically this starts out underneath the VP of engineering of the CTO. Common errors that are made with uh, back office folks uh, is a, uh, I can do it myself. Uh, entrepreneurs think that when they first get started and they've got, you know, two buddies working in the garage, that they really should be doing everything they can. And uh, usually the entrepreneur that has the one accounting course in college, he or she gets the one that gets to do the payroll. Uh, they also say that they can do this job because they just don't need any sleep. I actually have a story about Elon Musk, who is of Tesla fame right now. I guess he's a pretty famous guy in the Valley. Um, when I uh, was working with him at his first startup, a company called Zip2, uh, he was um, trying very desperately to do all things. And uh, it was the night before a board meeting. And he wanted to stay up and work on the board package himself rather than hand it off to anybody in the company. I came down here in Palo Alto where we had a, rented a storefront and, um, on California Drive. And I came here at 7.30 like this morning and the doors are wide open and the lights are all on and there's nobody in the office. We had probably half a million dollars worth of computer equipment sitting there just wide open to the, anybody that happened to walk in. Board meeting was at 8.30, there's no alarm. We kind of run around the office, can't find him. He's the CEO of the company. And we found him uh, asleep back in the kitchen in a closet. He'd taken a pad, put himself back there because he had spent the whole evening working on getting the board package. Uh, needless to say that his, um, his presentation with a little bed hair and bad breath just didn't go over very well with the board that morning. So you just don't want to do it yourself. Um, <clears throat> Often, we, if I find that I have CFOs that sometimes get promoted into the CEO spot, and they think that they can do both jobs. Um, George Northup, who's a, a well-known guy here in the Valley, his first step up from CFO to CEO was a company called Auction Drop, which was a front end to eBay. Uh, poor George, he did that for a while. He went back to that I don't need sleep solution. And uh, after about six months, he decided he had to get a CFO in place. Um, he's now done two or three more startups, and every time he hires a CFO right out of the box. Another thing that entrepreneurs do is they hire weak, cheap, or late. <clears throat> they have a tendency to hire people with little or no experience. Sometimes hire a relative or friend. That's always kind of a hard conversation when you have to fire your spouse over breakfast. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of difficult. Uh, so they, with the uh, young folks today, I'm kind of an old fart, so with young folks today, they want to hire via their Facebook friends. This is not to disparage uh, Craigslist, uh, but people expect that just because you have these social networks that you're able to hire people much more quickly than you might do otherwise. Um, even if you use Craigslist or other such uh, social networking sites for finding people and resumes, uh, it still takes a long time to find the right kind of people. One of the other errors I find that CEOs do uh, when it comes to hiring is <clears throat> they don't do it with any technical re review. Uh, CEOs uh, tend to believe that they can hire a CFO or a VP of marketing or you know, VP of engineering without having somebody to help them hire that person who has the technical capability to vet the individual. Uh, so oftentimes in our firm, we get called upon to you know, interview the CFO to find to be to find out if they're any good at the job. I had an occasion one time I asked the, the candidate uh, in front of the president, it was the final interview, I said, you know, the classic last question you asked in an in a, in a, in a interview says, you know, is there anything else about you that I need to know uh, that we haven't talked about? And this guy was applying for a job in a public company. He says, well, yeah, except I was convicted of a felony for fraud. Okay, you know, it's not a thing that you want to find out in the last interview. <laughs> yeah, something about doing background checks, particularly on the financial side. Um, also, uh, I find some entrepreneurs try to do things on the cheap. They want to hire at the very last second. I've had more than one occasions where we've had clients who are everybody on the staff has uh, come to me and said, you know, we're, we're leaving the firm. You know, uh, we just can't take it anymore. We're working 80 hours a week and we just need some help. And uh, you just don't want to wait that long before you uh, hire somebody. The other area that people tend to make mistakes in um, is they defer regular maintenance on the uh, back office. Um, actually, I got kind of carried away on this slide. I started thinking about one client company, and they did all the following things except the last item themselves uh, when, we got, when we got to them. Um, 
they got to the point where they were ready for the next round. It was a $7 billion round of financing. And I got a call. I was on vacation. And uh, the investors wanted gap books. Well, they hadn't been doing gap books, so they were going to hold up the financing. I was in France, and I was trying to figure out how in the world I could get gap financial statements to this uh, prospective uh, investor in time for them to do the round. This was a Friday. They needed it on Monday. Uh, the same company, when we entered it, managed to add simultaneous notices from the Employment Development Department, the Franchise Tax Board, and the IRS, who put a lien on their bank account. Uh, they not only were able to do that here in the United States, but they managed to do it in India as well, where they had 25 employees and had never bothered to give any of the employees uh, pay stubs to let them know much, how much money they had paid. And they, too, had uh, government uh, officials in their offices asking them where the payroll taxes were. How many people in the room here have uh, started companies and used bootleg software? Uh, okay. There comes a time when you, that sort of thing kind of catches up with you, um, particularly when you have to do due diligence and somebody asks you to show you all the licenses. And I, my good friends here at Wilson Sonsini will tell you that that's uh, always a no-no is if you uh, have software on your <coughs> servers that don't be doesn't belong there. More often than not, I've seen. Uh, Client companies forget about doing any sort of backup of their work. The engineers are hard pressed; they don't get things done in a timely fashion, and they just uh, forget about doing some sort of backup. Had a company in the video business, oh, uh, not too terribly long ago. They had uh, they weren't backing up their systems, and it turned out that they want they actually stepped out for a board meeting, left the office open, and uh, while they were gone, uh, thieves came in, stole all the computers. They had no server backup. And so they came back from the board meeting, and wham, there's nothing there. Uh, you just don't want to have any uh, problems on the HR side. Uh, one of the common issues is training your employees about sexual harassment, making sure that they're paid uh, a reasonable way, that uh, you provide a, an environment that's safe. Um, and you just want to make sure that you don't have those kinds of problems. Any other war stories? That's, I, did I, I saw some smiles as I was talking. People have probably run into this on a couple of occasions. Yeah, I may pick on you for later. Um, now, how does an organization evolve? Usually three founders kind of get together, and they uh, decide to create a company, a couple of guys, maybe a couple of gals. And uh, somebody Rochambeau's, and the person that loses ends up being head of administration. Um, that's not always the best way to do it, but that's a common theme. Oops. So the next thing to do is the founder engineer decides that he or she doesn't know what she's doing and that they really don't want to spend time on this sort of thing. And as a consequence, they go out and hire an office manager. Um, one of our client companies, I'm not sure this says well for our client companies, one of our client companies was a, uh, the founder was a uh, really like the Dave Matthews Band. He was a big time group. He would travel all around the country to, to watch this band. And so he found a, a kindred spirit in a woman that was a, also a kind of an indie band, band manager. And so they struck up a friendship, and so he hired her as office manager. She had no experience at running a company, no accounting background whatsoever. And yet, because she had um, run these uh, indie bands here in San Francisco, he felt that she was qualified to run the business. That's not very good, uh, but it's, it's very common. Let's just make one point about um, office managers that first hire, usually uh, who's not part of the founding team. Uh, this individual is most important to the company, and uh, I find that usually that person lasts about 18 months in a startup. You usually find him or her toes up underneath the desk because they've stretched that person so far that they really are, are uh, uh, pretty tired by the time they, uh, they get to about a year and a half, two years out. Um, usually try to find people that can be very versatile, um, but often entrepreneurs overlook the fact that they, uh, this individual is usually putting in 60 or 70 hours a week and not very well compensated. Any questions so far? Yes. Right. 
Absolutely. And you are uh, getting ahead of it a little bit, but that's, that's great. Uh, appreciate it, Doug. Um, the basic things that you want to worry about is I'm getting a voice from the back. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I need to repeat the question. Thank you. <laughs> I'm new at this. Uh, the question was, you know, what are the critical areas that you need to um, be concerned with when you're starting a startup because cash is always uh, 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 in low supply? So in answer to that question, uh, there are multiple things that you worry about. And I'll, I'll address most of it shortly, um, Doug, but really what you want to worry about as soon as you become a, a corporation and you act as employees, you have to get the payroll put in place. Um, many people want to keep track of their expenses. Uh, I call it checkbook accounting because in the very early stages, you're um, just spending money the first year or two as you, as you put a development, pr development project together. And what you want to do is keep track of that. Uh, often we find that that's shoebox accounting and folks just put it on an Excel spreadsheet or they literally have it in their checkbook. I think something simple as uh, in, Den in Denaro, which is a new accounting software, that's a front end to um, QuickBooks or QuickBooks itself is probably a good way to get started. You also, the other thing you want to do is make sure that you follow compliance rules. If you're working in the city of Palo Alto, get a city of Palo Alto business license. Uh, currently, the city of Burlingame, because it's so short on cash, they've gone around and hired uh, these collection agencies and they've pulled all of the businesses in the city of Burlingame at who their vendors are and then they have uh, I've been cold calling and sending, I'll say, subpoena-like collection notices to all the major businesses in the surrounding community to try and collect on business licenses. So that's a fairly aggressive approach. So just the simple stuff is, is probably what you look for. What I did was um, at the front desk before you came in, I left a checklist uh, that you should maybe pick up on your way out that gives you kind of a, a, a list of things that you should worry about. Is it, Doug, does that answer your question? <clears throat> so, so coming back to the organizational evolution, the uh, typical way in which the company starts to grow and develop, on, at least on the G&A side, is that the uh, company will hire out an outsourced accountant because uh, nobody wants to do the bookkeeping or payroll anymore. The office manager, who is usually overwhelmed with hiring engineers, uh, usually finds some outplacement recruiting company or outplacement HR firm to help them with benefits administration. And the, the VP of engineering, a CTO, uh, finally admits that they really can't take the time to run the system and the servers and hires an outsourced sysadmin. So, you know, looking at this, what's wrong with this picture is now you have uh, three different outsourced suppliers of services, and they're probably all from different firms, so they don't really coordinate with each other. In particular, <clears throat> I worry about when the, 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 excuse me, when the company uh, starts to grow that they're not coordinated from an operation standpoint. The next uh, level of evolution, I call it version 3.0, the company decides to hire its first full-time person and they go out and look for a controller. And um, usually they expect this controller to take, out the, take on the HR side of the business as well as everything from soup to nuts, uh, from payroll and payables uh, requirements up through CFO level kinds of skills. It's very hard to find a capable controller that can do this sort of thing, uh, that has that broad of a uh, range. And s the other thing that happens here is that, the, again, the system administrator and the controller aren't working for, with each other. Uh, this becomes more important as the company goes to revenue. And uh, because the, the accounting system that the controller has put together usually isn't tied in with any of the other systems of the, of the business. Uh, it's a common flaw for the classic way that organizations get put together. Just going rolling quickly forward um, as the organization grows, the company is, in this case, is a $25 million company with maybe 100 full-time equivalents. There's the CFO has finally been hired. They have got a director of human resources who's handling all that side of the business. And the CFO has generally started out hiring a, a financial staff uh, with accounting clerks and, and whatever is necessary to run the business. But again, still, there's, on the system administrative side, the VP of engineering is usually running system administration. And again, they're not coordinated. Uh, we have a client company right now that's uh, running about this run rate, and they're in the publishing business. 
And while we're uh, multinational in terms of our scope and our, uh, have clients such as McDonald's and Miller Beer and all kinds of world famous brands, uh, the publisher payment side, the cost of goods side of the business is completely disconnected from the accounting side of the business. And this is because the COO, who happens to be the spouse of the CEO, CEO um, doesn't like to talk to accounting. And so the only time we ever hear from her is if her expense reports are, are delayed. But meantime, we have no idea what cost of goods is for this business. I think she's short-lived for her role in the position. Lastly, you know, a much more mature company, you, the CFO or COO starts to uh, take on uh, the functional areas, director of planning, director of HR, and things of that nature. But at this point in time, usually the IT manager and the sysadmin and people are all under that individual's control. This is the right solution, but it's really too late to be integrated. Um, the accounting systems usually have to get uh, refreshed, and they have to get tied into the uh, sales force and all kinds of front-end revenue side of the business. Any questions at this point? Oh, you all must be asleep, or this is really dull. Go ahead. Well, in this, um, the question that was asked is, why does the IT side need to be connected to the accounting side or the financial side? In this day and age, the general way in which sales are recorded uh, through some sort of click-through or online environment, and while there are many softwares that have been developed to um, sell your goods and services, the physical goods, or maybe they're um, not physical goods, um, there, are, as there are not many um, softwares at the early stages that directly connect with those systems. And it has just the, been my experience, the propensity of the VP of engineering to want to have the system administration and the operations side of the business entirely under their control because they're starting out with a development environment. But nobody's thinking about the fact that they have to ultimately take that development environment convert it to an operating environment, and then connect it with the, the financial end of the business. So hopefully that's an answer to your question. And I'm, I'm probably overemphasizing the point this morning. So uh, what does it cost to run a back office? I have looked at our more than 400 clients over the last dozen years or so and did a quick survey in terms of the uh, expenses of running a back office uh, I can't see it particularly well, but the, the horizontal bar is really years from inception. It goes from years one to five, and it's dollars up the vertical axis. The green bars are pretty much the average annual costs of running the, of the back office. This is exclusive of the CEO's costs and some other matters. It's just really the finance, accounting, and HR side of the business. Uh, if you've got a business that's you know one year old, maybe it costs you forty thousand dollars a year to do if you're you're paying attention to it, and if it's uh, two year old, then it's ninety, and, and as you can see, that gets up up in the scale. Uh, my experience with companies that have done all those mistakes that I talked about up front, where they've deferred maintenance, where they have a hired weak, cheap, or late, um, or they've tried to do it themselves, the additional cost, the incremental cost to bring them up to what would be considered due diligence ready or to be ready for the next stage of the company's development is on an order of two or three times more than it would have cost otherwise. Uh, we have a client company that we're working with currently is trying to do a three-year audit with KPMG. They have never been audited before. They met us. They had um, a part-time controller, if you could call him that, who was uh, located in Hawaii. This is actually a San Mateo-based company who was most of its revenues in Japan, and he was doing everything on an Excel spreadsheet. So it's a software company in the tele telephone space, and it's taken a million one in fees and costs associated with uh, outside service providers just to bring them forward so that they could finish this audit and be ready for a pre-IPO kind of planning. Uh, that's a ton of money that, uh, to spend uh, trying to fix stuff. Um, so I would recommend highly that you know you don't have to spend a ton of money, as uh, Doug was asking about, but that you spend just enough to get you by, and it saves you much more later. Josh, Mark, I'll just uh, agree with you 100 percent on this. You know, when, we, when a client comes into us uh, for uh, an IPO or even a you know venture financing, and they're cleanup, it will easily double the size of the bill. 
That's just a legal bill? Yeah, I think Doug and I, a while ago, uh, work, worked on a client It was in the voice over IP uh, business. Um, they had, it when uh, they got started, they had 280 commercial customers, and they went on an acquisition um, uh, bent towards growing the company. Uh, they acquired uh, three companies for trying to do a reverse merger into a public shell, and um, went to 28,000 residential customers in a period of about six months. Found the CFO pretty much frozen at his desk, didn't know what to do. Uh, I got a call from the CEO, who was a friend of mine, said, come help us figure this out. Uh, I think the repair costs were north of a million dollars in a very short time. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the company never was able to get past that and uh, sank of its own weight in terms of trying to fix things. But you. You know, you should have seen the eyes of the accounts payable clerk. There was a single woman that was doing this when uh, literally mail trucks loads of uh, uh, bills came rolling up to the front door, and they just unloaded this entire truckload of phone bills for this poor gal. She ran out of the office screaming. I had to go repair, go replace two, her with four or five people. It was it was not a good it was not a good story. That's true. So, kind of key points here. What are the trigger points? This was the question that Doug had asked earlier. Uh, first point is when you hire employees. When you decide to finally hire somebody, that's, uh, that's when you have to kind of worry about what, uh, what the infrastructure looks like. There is a, go ahead, Doug. Well, I've got two questions. Okay. Thank you. I hope I can remember both. So the question is, you know, again, uh, how do you, with shortage of money, um, make this affordable, I guess, is the way to do it. And then secondly, when do you bring a CFO on board? Um, to the first point, most of the services that are necessary in order to just keep things rolling are very low cost. Uh, QuickBooks Online is $29.95 a month, so that's not particularly expensive to have an accounting system. Uh, their payroll services are, I think, an extra eight to fifteen dollars per head. Um, a business license in the city of San Mateo with your pre-revenue is a hundred dollars. Uh, these kinds of little things are not particularly expensive to have on board in terms of software and infrastructure. Um, outsource services such as myself may be on a per-hour basis seem expensive, but you're not having to hire us for a full-time gig. It's only come in once a month and just make sure that everything's nice and tidy. And I'm not doing this to, to tell you that, you know, hire us, uh, that, but it's just well that you find somebody that helps you out that is well versed in what to do and you don't have to hire on a full-time basis. And I actually have a couple of slides in the back of my presentation this morning that gives you some names of other companies that do this sort of thing. Um, but let me come back to, and in terms of the answer to the question about when do you hire a CFO, it depends on the velocity of the, of the speed of the company. If you're just going to bump along and um, be in development for a year or two, you probably don't need a CFO in place all the time. Um, you can probably just get by with a good quality accounting manager or somebody that handles your HR work. Uh, where it's important to have a CFO is at the time that you're strategizing for uh, the next round of financing. You need help putting that financing uh, package put 
together, or if you have some opportunities in front of you that are strategic, like a joint venture or an opportunity to buy another company or acquire a team of engineers, and you just need help working side by side with your company counsel and your investors to uh, handle the financial and business side of the, of the, the equation. Uh, Doug, does that seem to answer your question? Good. All right, so coming <clears throat> back to trigger points on transition, there is a lot of controversy in uh, the United States about what's contractor versus employee. The federal government's been giving out money to states to hire auditors to uh, ensure that uh, that distinction is uh, very clear. Um, contractors don't pay em employment taxes necessarily and governments are so hard pressed for money that they're coming after uh, companies who uh, have hired nothing but contractors when they in fact are uh, by law uh, considered employees. So that's a big tripping point right now. I, I know that a couple of my entrepreneur friends who have got nothing but contractors uh, but they're really by definition employees and if the uh, employment department catches up with them the penalties are pretty enormous. There's another step over point when you get in a, uh, beyond 50 employees where compliance issues uh, come into play. You have to do a lot more reporting both at the federal and state level um, and so you need to make sure that you have good quality HR help at that point. Uh, if you, most of the companies I see these days uh, are starting in, you know, still in the garage or working in at mom and dad's house or finding an apartment that they work out of. When you consolidate into a physical location, it's another uh, situation where you may need a CFO, you need some professional help uh, to make sure that you uh, do that lease correctly uh, with outside counsel. The next tripping point is in terms of physical location is you go to multiple locations. Uh, we have a client now that's expanding internationally and they're going to five different international locations, Singapore, Europe, uh, all over the United States. And this causes a lot of, uh, a lot of grief because you have to register in all those countries. Uh, when you're just using mom and dad's money, I mean, I, my own son is 31, he's got a startup going, and right now it's bank of mom and dad. He hasn't really tapped into any professional money. But when you take on professional money, you know, the bar gets raised in terms of the professional quality of the infrastructure. The, uh, the entrepreneurs that are asking you to give monthly financial statements and they expect them to be in a gap format, they expect uh, professionally prepared financial plans, and, you know, they want to make sure there are no issues on the human resources side. You also want to make sure your accounting system is up to snuff uh, when you have the advent of revenue. Uh, you want to make sure this is like three to six months away from revenue generation. Usually the first 10 to 20 deals are all one-off deals. They're, not, they're all unique and it usually drives the CFO crazy because the sales guy and gal is out there make, cutting individual deals. And you just need to make sure that your accounting system can handle all the variations on the same theme. Uh, next tripping point would be when revenue is coming from multiple channels. If you're selling internationally in Europe and you have to suddenly deal with uh, VAT tax issues or you're selling here in the United States and you have sales tax issues and you're doing it by direct sales as opposed to internet, all those things make a difference in terms of how you, the back office has to respond. You know, that's all well and good when you've got one to five to eight million dollars of revenue. Everybody pretty much, if they've got some kind of success, can get to that point. But then when you get to real revenues, that's where you're 25, 50, 100 million dollars, then you have to probably upgrade the accounting system once again. Always, always you want to be planning for the exit. The exit may come sooner than you think. Uh, sometimes, you know, you're Facebook and you get, how about $50 billion or however much money they got recently, $450 million. So you always want to make sure that your due diligence ready. Uh, make sure that your uh, administrative group is make, uh, has got you, your back office uh, squared away. There's this little thing called Sarbanes-Oxley. Uh, if you're going to be acquired by a public company, make sure you have to be uh, Sarbanes-Oxley ready. Uh, I can't tell you nowadays how much it costs to put uh, a company uh, up to speed, but a couple of years ago we had to do one and it was probably north of a half a million dollars of cost just to do that. And if you're pre-IPO, Doug, Herb, what would a pre-IPO company cost in terms of uh, just getting ready?
project is what redo this entire function. Any questions to this point? Sir in the back. I have one. You've alluded a few times to international activities. Yes. Sure. It's a the question. The question is, you know, how do you keep tabs on the international side, uh, and how do you, you know, I guess, suppose from a, a, a general administrative point of view, um, it's three times to a hundred times more difficult than it is to do something domestically. Um, it takes over communication. I think is the key thing. Um, we have a current client that's uh, operating in India, and the, um, we hired a controller out there, and uh, he and I probably talk at, God knows, it's always 11 to 12 o'clock at night, probably every other night or so to make sure that he and I are in sync in terms of what's going on on, on his side of the world. Uh, you have, uh, the difficulty is always cultural, it's always a time zone issue, uh, there's legal and tax and uh, accounting issues. Uh, when you're working cross-cultural. And if you haven't had much experience of working in that environment before, um, you can really get tripped up on all kinds of, um, uh, mostly taxes, things as well, things that I seem to, to see the issues. Uh, also, if you've hired, and nobody here has ever had a company, I'm sure, that ever had to do a RIF, uh, lost employees, but it's always more difficult uh, outside of the United States to, to let people go. Uh, my current favorite is Belgium and Italy. I had to let a managing director go in Italy and, and basically I had to buy the guy off in order to get him out of there. But it took me six months to get the job done. It was really terrible. So um, it's enormously more complex, particularly when you have deal with revenues and you have transfer pricing issues. Does that answer your question in the back? Factors that are, you know, affect transition to the point of the gentleman in the back of the room, uh, how complex it is at a multinational basis. Uh, what Doug has already talked about on a couple of occasions, cash availability. So as I spoke to earlier, it's the velocity of the corporate change. If things are just bumping along, it's not a big deal. But if things are moving rapidly up or down, it uh, makes a big difference in terms of your, uh, your back office. The quality of planning. Um, if, you, if you have uh, people that don't do any planning whatsoever, um, they really, really can snap through the, the back office system. Also, the flexibility of the installed systems. I've, I've talked about QuickBooks a couple of times. It seems to be the de facto accounting system for small companies. It's not a very flexible system. Anytime you need inventories, you need to have foreign currency translation. It's not very flexible at all. So you, you really need to have systems that can grow with a company. And lastly, this, of course, goes across all departments. It's really the quality of the personnel. Uh, and, that, and in our case, we always want to make sure we overhire for the roles that we're putting people into because the company, if it's going to grow, is going to outstrip them very quickly. Lastly, I just point out the, the ideal organization chart, at least from my perspective, is that you want to always try and find, if you're going to outsource the G&A side of the business, that you find a full service outsource uh, firm that can handle both the accounting and the, and the human resource side, and that you really tie it into the uh, system administrative side. Lastly, as I promised, uh, as I'm wrapping up the presentation this morning, I wanted to give you some names of some companies and groups that have been in the Valley for a while that I think are worthy of your attention if you're ever trying to build a company or, or you need some help in this area. My, my competitive friends here in the Valley are is this group of people. Uh, Creative Solutions and FLG Partners are probably best known for working with mid-tier and uh, later stage companies. FLG Partners isn't necessarily a full service firm, they're a CFO only but they're very, very high quality folks. Their resumes are, are really outstanding. The other groups, Deborah Kranz, Montgomery, and Murdoch, and Ravix, all have 20 to 30 years of experience in helping outside you know, startup companies get going, and I recommend them highly. So, yes, sir. I don't know how to ask these questions. Absolutely. Um, among this group of people, there are several, the question, <laughs> get reminded from the back of the room, how much does these services cost uh, was the question. Um, for this group of people, the services are priced differently 
Um, some of them are done on a per hour basis. In our firm, that's the way we operate. Some have a uh, retainer or a monthly minimum. Others want a piece of the action. Deborah Krantz, as I understand it, never uh, starts with a client unless she can have some percentage of the ownership. So uh, it's a little bit all over the board, uh, Doug. On a per hour basis, the uh, typical costs, uh, you can pretty much figure uh, the rule of thumb is if you have a $100,000 a year accounting manager or controller, that you probably uh, should be charged about $100 an hour. So it's a, you know, just take a couple, a decimal point off or so. Uh, fees range for accountants in the Valley to be from $60 to $85 an hour. Uh, controllers are probably $135 to $180 an hour. CFOs run the gamut of you know, $200 to $300 an hour. So those are the kinds of costs. Yes, Doug. I have, I'm aware of some of them that do that, like Wilson Sassini is willing to do, sign up with them. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, a few do, but not many. I, you know, when I've offered stock in a company uh, um, uh, in lieu of uh, getting cash, Usually it means the company's not that good and they're willing to hand it out for free. The companies I want to have stock in are the companies that are unwilling to sell it to me. So that's usually my gauge. Uh, I find that if a, a rental CFO wants to take, uh, do some on the come, uh, maybe in return for some stock or a future payout later, that uh, they're either not particularly good or they're so full of themselves that they don't think they need to uh, take the money up front. And I've never really found people that are willing to take the risk uh, right up front that I think are high quality. And that's a bias on my part, I guess. Just to be side of the Sure. So for the, for the webinar, uh, Doug's question was, well, why wouldn't a rent a CFO qualify for uh, having stock? Because they are, in fact, part of the management team. I think your initial question was whether uh, are there service providers that will take stock up front in, or uh, in lieu of getting cash, much like some recruiters do, will they take a third of their uh, retainer in this form of stock? Uh, that's not to say that they don't do that, but I, I'm a leery of people that take stock up front uh, because uh, you're really not getting any cash compensation. You don't have quite the skin in the game. Uh, I'm pretty risk adverse uh, individually. I probably only invest or uh, take stock in a company of about one in ten opportunities. Uh, I don't see any problem with a CFO or rent a CFO having a stock plan similar to the employees of the company. Usually the CFO would get between three quarters of a point and a point and a half of stock in the option pool. And at, you know, say you're working two days a week for them, that maybe you get two fifths of that as part of your compensation. But there's usually a cash component up, up front because I want the entrepreneurs to have uh, some pain, I suppose, in hiring me to do some work for them. Does that answer the question? Great. Anyway, so among the service providers in the Valley here, there are many more that I haven't listed. But these are the kind of the, the uh, ones that have been around for a while, and you know I, I would say most everybody here would, uh, from Wilson Sonsini would recommend. Um, on the outsource IT side, again there are lots of companies out. We use Lighthouse and every network on a regular basis. Seems most of our entrepreneurs are web hosting through Rackspace or Amazon, and our e everybody is emailing uh, via Google. In terms of accounting software, I'll throw the slide up. Front for everybody, I don't expect you to uh, memorize this list, but at the early stage, there's uh, lion's share companies that are out in the marketplace. We tend to use uh, QuickBooks Online. That seems to be the most convenient for everybody. It's also not particularly flexible, as I talked about earlier. The mid-stage, Microsoft Dynamics and Inact seem to be the most popular accounting softwares, and certainly at the ERP level, uh, SAP and Oracle are, are, the, are the premier firms. In terms of costs, 
Uh, usually the early stage companies, if you buy the software package outright, it's a couple hundred bucks to a couple thousand. And mid-stage, uh, the implementations usually runs in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. I put the 10,000 up there, I think that doesn't happen very often. On the insurance and payroll side, there's again lots of insurance brokers out in the valley, but probably the premier ones are listed above, Heffernan, Sequoia, Sweet & Baker, Taylor Wallace, and Woodrow Sawyer. On the payroll side, Intuit and Payroll Resources Group. Payroll Resources Group is probably not that uh, well known to people, but it has a great hands-on approach to uh, running your business when it's really small. At this point, I talk about Trinet and Administaff. Um, just, frankly, I don't like them. I uh, hope I haven't offended anybody in the room. But they're good for, uh, I certainly will. This is a, these are service firms that provide uh, benefits administration. They actually own the employee. Uh, they take care of all the, quote, payroll and administrative side of the business. They'll have a 401k plan for you. And they come in and sell you the, uh, the service on the basis that you're going to get really outstanding um, benefits for your employees at a low, low cost. What they don't tell you is the fees on a per employee basis are probably running between two to $700 an employee per month. So um, it's good for companies that don't want to hire an HR part of the business. And they run between, you know, I'll say a dozen people to maybe 50 people. That's kind of a sweet spot for them. But to extract yourself from that organization, either of them, uh, is very, very difficult and costs you know, tens and tens of thousands of hours to get done. So th that's kind of why I'm a little bit uh, disgruntled with them. I actually had a case with one of those companies where we had to do a RIF, and they had always promised that their consultants would help us get this done. We had to let go a large number of employees, and we were counting on their consulting staff to augment ours. And the night before the uh, transition, uh, they called up and said, oh, well, we can't do this. And suddenly I had to go find five or six people in order to help us to humanely let, uh, I think it was something like 85 people go in a matter of a few hours. And I, it was just a, a criminal uh, response to uh, the services. So I have a bad taste in my mouth if you couldn't guess. Anyway, question in the back. So the question is, as companies grow, what are the common mistakes that they make as they gravitate from uh, early stage accounting system to perhaps a later stage? Um, typically, I find uh, they do it too late. Uh, that's the most common error. Um, I think that many companies, uh, the best way to tell when they're, it's too late is they're spreadsheeting themselves to death. When you find that you're using Excel or other kinds of databases outside of the accounting system to run the accounting system, then you're, you're already too late. Um, companies can probably work with these early stage uh, accounting systems up to, I'll say, five to $10 million in revenue if they're simple businesses. Uh, but if you throw any kind of complexity uh, about the, around the company, um, to my earlier point of the advertising company was using click-throughs, there's no connection, there's no accounting software on this list up here that can connect to the software necessary to measure the click-through. So you have to automatically look at a SAP, Business One, or a Microsoft Dynamics to make that happen. Uh, when you go for mid-stage ERP, that's usually uh, your pre-IPO, you're uh, running at 100 million and above kind of level because these are usually million dollar uh, conversions. Other questions? Yes, lady in the back. Sure. Uh, good question. The question is, you know, why uh, avoid the transition and the pain involved, perhaps uh, by just starting out with a good system? Well, it is just to um, do an extraordinary example, I wouldn't want to put in a three-person company a SAP uh, million-dollar accounting system. Um, there are entrepreneurs that I've run into that want, uh, like that philosophy, and sometimes the investors have pushed them towards that. This was common in the dot-com boom bust. We're going to go, 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 go. We're going to spend $20 million to get web van off the ground. And let's get the accounting system that can handle distribution systems. Bang, 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 bang. And so they spent all that money and they never, the revenue never reached the, the goals. And as a consequence, they had this big area of infrastructure and they couldn't dislodge it quickly enough in order to save the company. So 
you want to bleed a little bit, but you want to not be ahead of the game. I usually like to see the revenues start to come in before I start to transition the accounting system. Um, I think I saw a study not too terribly long ago where I took the top 100 software companies uh, in the United States and looked at the speed at which they got to their first $50 million on an inflation-adjusted basis. So this included Microsoft and Oracle and all these famous companies. And it turns out that it takes them, like, they took them on an average of nine years to get to that first $50 million. So most of you, you know, think in terms of getting to that B and C round of financing and, oh, boy, we're going to hit $25, $50 million by the time we hit that C round. It just doesn't happen, right? Facebook aside. Any other questions? Yes, sir, in the back. So if I heard the question properly, and it was hard for me to hear you, was what's the best accounting software for early stage? I would say um, QuickBooks Pro, the enterprise level, which is about a $2,500 software. You can gravitate for the online to the desktop to the enterprise pretty easily. It's about a 20-minute exercise. NetSuite is very good. I'd say Sage, Peachtree as well are also good for early stage companies. So just trying to wrap up because I know I want to get us out on time. Um, in terms of resources on the audit and tax side, uh, the, I have a few comments about the big four. Actually, I'm an Arthur Young alumni, so uh, you know, I, I you know, won't disparage my own firm. Uh, but the, the big four firms have traditionally uh, wanted to uh, be in the small startup space. Pricewaterhouse and E&Y were famous uh, years ago for taking every startup that you know, got any kind of financing. And when Sarbanes-Oxley came around, they uh, abandoned all of them. And actually, they abandoned a lot of venture firms at the same time because they just weren't big enough because they saw all these big dollar signs associated with the Sarbanes-Oxley uh, opportunity. They have since come back into the marketplace. So if you need a really cheap audit, uh, you would go call them up. Uh, just be leery of the fact that they may again exit the market at any given time. Uh, in terms of quality, clearly they're the best in the world. Uh, I can't speak to one over another, uh, but they, if you have a complex uh, tax or uh, accounting background uh, for your company, they are, the, they are, of course, the premier firms of the world. When all those firms exited in the Valley uh, about five or six years ago, uh, the mid-tier firms came up to speed and they started to become the uh, players in this field. Armino McKenna, BDO, Frank Rimmer, and the rest on this list are all high quality firms. I'm sure there are other firms that are out there. These are the ones that we tend to work with and uh, are all tech savvy um, and understand the tech business. One of the advantages of these smaller firms is that you tend to get a little bit more personal service. You can actually get the partner on the phone if you need the question answered. Also, their pricing is much less expensive um, on average, a first-year audit is between twenty-five and thirty-five thousand uh, dollars for a startup company who's got real financing, um, and then the, the price is fairly level thereafter. The way the big four price their their, uh, their costs is they'll come in with a low-ball number of fifteen or twenty thousand, and then they want to get you the full fees within two or three years. And so all of a sudden, it's the same size audit is suddenly 30,000, suddenly 45 or 50,000, even though you haven't changed the amount of transactions. So just be a little leery of that when you're working with them. This pretty much wraps up what I had to speak about this morning. Um, I hope it's been mildly entertaining. I've seen at least one or two smiles and nods in the back. Are there, at this time, any other questions before we call it a day? Doug. Sure. So the question is, can I comment on insurance? How much does it cost? When should we get it? And maybe the types of insurances. Um, well, first off, well, as soon as you incorporate uh, you and get any kind of money involved, you probably need to get just general business insurance. Uh, Hartford is probably the best known uh, underwriter in this arena, and it probably costs between $500 and $1,000. So it's an easy out-of-the-box kind of uh, solution. 
when you get professional money, usually the, aunt, the investors ask you to either get key man insurance, uh, certainly DNO or ENO insurance to protect their uh, soft hineys in order to make sure that they're covered. So uh, those insurance policies are running probably between a couple thousand per million of coverage uh, to several, several tens of thousands of uh, dollars per million. Basically, they cover the directors and officers for uh, any litigation, usually sometimes around the uh, disgruntled shareholders uh, or wrongful termination or uh, I guess, I'm not sure what else to slip and fall. Well, that's the, business, that's the business insurance. You also want to make sure you're legally bound to get workers' comp as soon as you have contractors and employees working in a facility. So that's a requirement. It's a, the fees usually runs uh, as do, to 75 cents to two bucks per hundred dollars of payroll, and it's state mandated and it's uh, state regulated in terms of pricing. So there's no real price advantage. Um, the key man life insurance is usually on the, the founder, CTO, or who is the guru that you don't want to lose if they end up. Uh, getting run over by a bus and you've got to find some, somebody else to replace them. Um, what's been really interesting in the, in the insurance side is with all these social networks, there are um, a number of problems associated with privacy, uh, with content that nobody would ever have thought of where you know, we've got um, you know, MySpace and you know, your 15-year-old daughter is suddenly getting uh, pedophiles as friends on their MySpace page and you want to sue MySpace for that, uh, allowing that to occur. So there's a whole new area of insurance that's coming up that is not settled yet and most of the insurance companies I've been working with really don't know how to cover this very well. So uh, if you're in the social networking space or anywhere in the mobile phones app space, uh, this is a, a, still an area of concern. Doug, does it help answer the question? Yes, sir, in the back. You probably want, the question is, do you want to, the question is when do you incorporate and, and incur all these overhead expenses? Um, delay as long as you can, but the minute you hire your first contractor or employee who's not part of that founding team uh, is when you probably need to make, set up that corporation to provide you and your other co-founders with some sort of protection and shield from uh, wrongful termination, uh, you know, uh, a dispute over the contractor's work for services and the ownership of the intellectual property. That's, that's when you want to get that shield, you know, either a Delaware corporation or, or a California corporation. Thanks, Harv. Sir. Actually, I would refer to our, my legal friends. The question is, <laughs> you know, can I, can I talk about the intellectual property side with Elan, maybe Herb or... or Thank you. 
I would say it's much like work for hire in software that you're, you have a contract with the developer, the person that's creating this IP for you that would, uh, the, you end up owning the resultant product that you just have to make sure that your relationship with that individual, that is clear cut that that's the, that's the relationship and that of course you pay them for that service as long as they provide it. So I mean, that's the first level of protection. Uh, No. Two more things. You're the uh, expert. Like any time you hire somebody on the outside, you want to be careful who you're hiring. And where it's, <coughs> um, where it's IP, it can be very crucial um, stuff to your, uh, your business going forward. So you want to be very careful in that. You know, what, what's the quality of the work? Um, you know, how do you know that, that uh, there aren't Trojans inside of it? Question to uh, Doug first. Actually, you've touched on a very good topic. Doug, thank you for raising it. I, I did want to, yeah, I did want to talk a little bit about the angel groups. The question was, what in terms of insurances, what are the angel uh, investors doing with regards to requiring insurances? Traditional VCs are always asking for DNO and ENO types of insurance, key man. Um, <clears throat> they're not asking for it, uh, surprisingly. Um, they're not asking for any coverage in this arena, and yet I think they're actually more exposed than traditional VCs because uh, there has been this rise of super angels in the Valley which have gotten a lot of press these days in TechCrunch, uh, and particularly since they had dinner together and uh, you know, were colluding supposedly. Um, anyhow, the, you know, these guys and gals are investing in 20, 30, 40, 60 companies all in one pop, uh, you got Dave McClure, who's you know f 500 startups. He has, I think, something like 65 companies in his portfolio. I can't understand how he can pay attention to all 65 investments adequately to make sure that they're following you know the rules that you need to follow in order to make sure that you don't get in some trouble down the road. And with res uh, insurance, I don't know how he's covered right for himself uh, with these investments. So the short answer to your question is. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, we've been working with a lot of these uh, super angels in our in our client uh, environment, and um, I, you know I think that I, I could go off for another half an hour and talk about super angels and how that's in, impacting the venture community. Maybe that's a another session down the road, but I'll uh, leave that alone for now. But there was another question in the back.
Well, that, the question is, you know, when should a company start thinking about stock option awards and how to plan for that? And um, boy, that's a that's a whole subject unto itself. Uh, I would say that here in the valley, it's common that as soon as you bring a friend on board as your as outside of that initial founding group, that you automatically have to start thinking about the option plan because anybody that's coming. Uh, to work with you is in a high risk environment. Uh, they're going to want some piece of the action. It's just part of the, the, the nature of the beast in the arena. You go outside of the United States, it's very uncommon uh, to find that sort of uh, arrangement. Um, and usually you want to hire professionals. I'll say this is when you need a CFO for hire to help you uh, frame that plan and uh, make sure that the whole compensation program for your first 20, 30, 50 employees is already thought out in advance before you start handing out securities. So, but that's, again, that's a whole subject in which uh, the folks here at Wilson Cincinnati can spend a lot of time. I would just say, uh, in, in adding to what Mark said about the importance of having professional help at that time, uh, recent accounting, these past five years, accounting and tax uh, rules uh, and changes have really raised the stakes of getting this right. So I think we're one last question very quickly. Yes. The question is, uh, if I bring a friend on board and promise them some sort of equity compensation, am I exposing myself? Uh, wide open. I think that I'll let uh, Herb respond to it because it's really a legal question. Yeah. No, you're, you're, um, you, you have the potential to make yourself unfundable right there because uh, you, know, you make some sort of promise like this. It takes another three months to, and again, it's, it, it's not the setting up the corporation. It's until the, end, the business really gets going forward. It takes about three months until you actually allocate the stock, the friend by now has decided that uh, she needs benefits or, or her spouse wants benefits so she says thank you, I'm going to go do something else. Um, and uh, your venture takes off, becomes a negative Facebook, it's going to be guaranteed that that now ex-friend comes and says, well remember that promise you made to me and remember that, that little bit of code, or uh, well it wasn't even code, remember that part of the business plan that I put together? Uh, I should get you know, a third of Well, I'm afraid we're pretty much out of time. If there are other questions, I'll hang around for a few extra minutes and be happy to answer them uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, if I, my closing remarks, if I leave you with any thoughts, you know, don't do it yourself, don't chew it cheap, weak or late, and don't defer the maintenance. Anyway, you've been a, uh, a nice audience this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Wilson Sassini and the Wharton School for having me.